you had a blank checkbook and you didn't have any restrictions, how would you shape things to make sure the nation's ready to address the next fight near peers? And then if you can kind of lead that into what you're doing today now that you're sure. you're out. Sure. Well, there's a couple of things I would do. What I would start with is I would start with the organization that builds the defense part of the president's budget, which is CAPE and OSD. It's Capability Analysis and Program Evaluation. And the way we build our defense budget in general is we start with last year's and we modify it. And so if you're coming out of 20 years of ground war where most of the money has gone into ground forces, you're going to start with that last year's budget and you're going to modify it. And so it takes years of modifications to change to a budget that's focused on air, cyber, space, and naval forces that you need to fight China. Part of the reason is we don't have an agreed on set of analytical tools to be able to work through a process to say, what's it going to take to deter China or if we have to fight them, when? And so it comes down to arguing in politics between services, between senior leaders in the services, uh, between uh, great career civilians and political appointees and OSD trying to do their best and then on the Hill. So you need to start with the analysis of the threat and decide you know, what's effective. You need the analytical tools to back that up. And then you need to take a look at the rules that we've built around how we acquire things, which in general, our rules were written uh, during a Cold War era to provide the maximum oversight by Congress and the most fairness to defense contractors. They weren't written to provide new capabilities at scale and speed to war fighters as they need them. And so if we really want to deter a fight with China, we need to go back and look at those processes. Do we have analytical tools that we can rely on to tell us what we'll need? Can we change our budgeting process so that we prioritize those instead of breaking everything a little bit and salami slicing everything across the military? And then are we willing to change our rules to accept some risk in the way we acquire things so that we can do them at the speed that we need to? And on the outside, part of what I've learned about that is, look, you know, we're a country built on free enterprise and personal freedom, and yet we run our defense department and acquisition on a Stalinist model of central direction, <laughs> you know, that, like I said, General Creech would roll over in his grave over. Uh, if we're going to solve these problems, the way America solves its problems is by coming up with ideas that somebody can make money off of while solving those problems. So, you know, I'm working on the outside with a mix of smaller companies that have capabilities that warfighters need and could deliver those faster at speed if the regulations would let them. But look, we are always going to have to have Huntington Ingalls that builds nuclear submarines and Lockheed Martin that builds the F-35. I mean, these are technological marvels that, right. that you can't step, make a startup go build. So... We're going to have to balance uh, those two things, but we're going to have to work through with the big guys, with the tools they need to go faster and down into the little innovative places and make sure that we're willing to accept some broken glass in order to move things faster. The incentives for our people in our program offices are basically written around, if you're a program manager, if you pad your schedule a little bit and pad your budget a little bit, deliver your program within that padded schedule and budget, obligate your money on time, even though it'll be a little late and cost a little more because of difficulties with the contractor, you get to move up and go to a bigger program. There's nothing that says take risk, see if you can deliver this six months earlier, and you know maybe you'll fall short, but maybe you won't. See if you can deliver it faster, or if you need more money to deliver it faster, come tell us and prove to us you can do it. There's no incentive structure that supports that. It's built on do everything in the set way. Don't take any risk. I would ask squadron commanders at squadron commander school. I would talk about that environment I talked about where you wait for chariot directs. And I go, look, it's possible. I don't know. It's possible, though, that we've taught you as you come into this job that the way to succeed is, you know, keep your head down. Don't make <laughs> eye contact. Wait for somebody else to mess up and then get to move to be a group commander, you know, coming out of that. That's not what I want. <laughs> what I want you to do is pretend like you have the authority and responsibility that you should have in this job and figure out ways to accomplish your mission that I've given you 
within the budget and resources I've given you and within the Air Force's core values. If you can do that, I don't care how you do it. I'll learn from how you do it. And there's a left and right limit, you know, that any reasonable person could operate in. And as long as you stay within that and do those things, I'm good. If you get outside of those left or right limits, then, you know, we'll have a talk and we'll try to teach you to come back in. And if we can't, I'll get another squadron commander. But there's a lot of room here to operate.